be thinking a little. We'll also be thinking uh, a little bit about uh, moving towards the interview. Although we hope to do a session later on for those of you that are successfully shortlisted for preparing for the interview. Um, we've got some uh, a wonderful team of people here to um, share their expertise. I think uh, I would call it on um, applying for grid. Um, neonatal, I'm not allowed to call it grid. There's a swear job calling it grid. We've got to call it subspecialty training and says now. So uh, for subspecialty training, but we, um, we're we gonna start with um, uh, Dr. Maura Campbell, who uh, is the chair of the neonatal CSAC. And because she's on call, um, I think we're gonna push on, <laughs> let, her, let her tell you everything she knows about the application form and, uh, uh, and the interview process. So we can let her get back to um, uh, her busy day job. Or evening job as it is this evening. So welcome, Maura, and thank you for joining us. We really appreciate your uh, your expertise and input. So am I sharing my screen now? Yes or no? Yes, we can. Okay, we can see it as not a slideshow though, as a. It should be yeah. slideshow now. Perfect. Yeah, great. Okay, good evening, everybody. Um, I'm really going to just talk you through um, um what to think about in terms of filling out your form. Not specifics, very general things, but actually it's some basic stuff that you need to be aware of um, when you sit down and after the website opens for um, form. So I think what's really important at the outset is you need to fulfill, fulfill the minimum requirements. And this is difficult in that the rules have changed. So people previously were applying from ST7, that is not possible anymore. And that is as per our CPH guidelines and applies to all grid programmes. So particularly those of, two, of three years in duration. So you need to have signed off approval of your level two competencies. This is particularly important um, for those people who are applying um, ST4, ST5. Uh, the approval form from your TPD deanery, and this is now a Kaizen form that you will be able to complete. Anybody who's an ST6 needs prospective approval of um, their ST6 posts to count towards the training from CSAC. And the email you get, I most of these tend to come to me, um, but the email you receive, I tell everybody to hold on to it for their own records and to copy and upload it onto the Kaizen form with the approval from the TPD. And what's critically important is that you can have a maximum of 12 months of ST6 training recognized to contribute towards GRID, but you must have 24 months training time remaining from the start of GRID. And that is from August, September, 2023. Okay, so, Assuming that you're ticking all of those boxes straight off, um, in terms of your starting points, make sure that you've got, um, you've downloaded the guide to recruitment for 22-23. The guide changes every year. There's always small, subtle changes across the form. So it's really important that you have this year's there. It's also useful to have an idea of what the neonatal medicine syllabus actually looks like and what the key capabilities um, we're looking to develop in individuals over the course of this training. We, the form assesses clinical experience, audit and QI, research, publications and presentations, management and leadership, education, and there is a final supporting statement that you need to complete and submit. Um, just shown here is the timeline, which I'm sure you're all very familiar with. So the programmes advertised should be now up on the RCPCH website. I haven't actually checked myself today to see if that is there. Um, I think we have 46 posts this year, which is um, more than usual. We're normally sitting at about 35 to 37. And that's in some ways to look to compensate for any potential bulge associated with progress club. Applications open on Oriel on the 26th of October. You must have your deanery eligibility forms by the 7th of November and applications close on the 6th. Um, 
invitation shortlisting process happens at the latter part of November and invitations to interview will be out on Wednesday the 14th of December. So you'll get it before Christmas and interviews will be on the week of the 23rd of January. So they're over three days, 24th to the 26th. In terms of filling out your application, I think it's really useful to get input for people who've been through the process themselves. Um, guidance from um, consultants or mentors you've got within neonatal services, but it's really important that it's you who completes the application. Don't copy from somebody else. Um, every once in a while we pick up on that. If we're looking at forms intensely and looking at one question across all candidates, it often automatically rings a bell if we read something that's exactly the same as somebody else's, and it is a probity issue. Make sure you answer the question that's asked. So even though you've done some really exciting things, things you think are really interesting, if the question is not actually asking for you to put those things in, it's not going to improve your score. If you haven't answered the question in a way that the marking fits in with the marking scheme, um, then you're not going to get points associated with it. So make sure when you're answering a question, you read it clearly and actually refer to the assessment criteria for that question. As I said, get input from somebody, but actually make sure that you're open to constructive feedback. You want to put your best self forward. It's a highly competitive process. I'm expecting probably about 120 applicants. Um, so you want somebody who's going to give you feedback so that you can make your application better. Um, so choose the individuals carefully and ensure that if you're going to ask somebody, the consultant, to have a look at your form, ensure you've given them sufficient time. If the, if the deadline is on a Monday and you send them the, the, your form on a Friday afternoon, it is unlikely you're going to be able to get valuable input that can change the content of your form. So you can't expect somebody to go through everything for you with 48 hours notice before the deadline. So plan well in advance. If the one take home message people can get, it's that not all domains are equal. So you, what you need to do is you need to think about the domains where it is easier to improve your scores. And that's where you need to focus your energies on. So it's not all the same marks for each domain. The clinical one has six points associated with it. So it's critically important that, that um, you take time and effort and energy focusing on that. You're not going to conjure up five peer reviewed first author publications for your um, publications section or any complex research history. So if you don't have a lot of evidence for that, don't spend your time fretting and trying to make something sound like it's complex research. The point system is quite tough in those domains. You're actually much better filling out the domains that are clinical, audit, education, and your supporting statement and doing those very well so that you optimize your points in those areas. So as I said, clinical experience is scored out of six. Um, the question is, this year, describe your clinical experience to date and the skills you've acquired, both in acute emergency and non-acute settings that are significant and specific to your subspecialty application, including details of transferable skills and your overall approach to patient care. So as you so draft your answer, read it through and then look at the scoring system and ask yourself, have you given more than two specific and significant examples of skills gained throughout your clinical training? Have you demonstrated the, the relevance to neonatal training and what, how you have developed yourself and how you've demonstrated patient-centered approach? Um, and because you're going to have to have ticked all of those things off and written a wonderful answer to actually come up with a six in that. If you've only put in one significant and specific example of skills relevant to neonates, then you're going to get a two for that. So all areas on the form really need to be filled in while looking at the scoring system. 
at the end of the document um, that's describing, you can get from the website for the 22-23 recruitment, there's actually some good narrative at the end, giving further explanations, which I think is important for you all to have a read of. So audits and QI, they ask for involvement in quality improvement, audits providing evidence where you have identified an opportunity for QI and subsequently look to improve clinical effectiveness, patient safety or the patient experience. They want to know what your level of involvement is with each stage and highlight what has changed as a result of each project and describe what you have learned about quality improvement audits. So what's really important is that if you have a variety of audits or QI projects, if there are ones that you have clearly demonstrated a change in service and improved patient experience or enhanced patient outcomes and have gone through the process, then those are the ones that are better to include than something that you think sounds like a really fancy, trendy project. Um, so sometimes it is things that are more straightforward, whether it's implementation of new scoring to sort of try and reduce um, postnatal antibiotic prescription. If you've got something that could be is clear, succinct, you've got a clear outcome, you've demonstrated significant change, and you've done something that's improved stuff um, for patients, and that's the sort of examples we need to be thinking of. Um, education has two sets of points. One, it's about the types of education that you have delivered. And entirely separate to that is whether you've got formal teaching. So somebody may get, have a GIC or a teach the teachers, and that will get you one point. But actually, if you're only delivering local department teaching, your total scope in that domain will be two. While somebody who's delivering regional postgraduate teaching, um, I'm doing some stuff with medical students, and has a GIC because an NLS instructor, they'll get themselves three points for that. I think the statement to support your application is incredibly important. Um, it asks you to outline your career aims and motivations along with additional information you would like to provide to support your application, particularly with regard to demonstrating your commitment to the specialty that you're applying for. So actually, we want to know, you know, what's your motivation? You know, what can you tell us about what you've done to date that shows that you've got an in-depth understanding and a commitment to neonatal medicine, that you've described the things that you've done above and beyond to enhance your skills, enhance your training, and that actually you're describing a potential career path, but one that's actually realistic. Sometimes people put in things that they're going to be um, some ultra super specialist neonatal, neonatologist, but actually there's no other evidence to support that career pathway. And that doesn't quite add up while somebody who put in an application clearly describes um, involvement with families, supporting families, having attended study days um, in terms of family integrated care, actually saying that they would have a particular, would, look to be a neonatologist with a specific interest in by care or whatever, that would seem like um, an appropriate um, career aspiration. Leadership and management experience. Um, I think the one thing I would say is if you've done one rota, if you've done five rotas or if you've done 10 rotas, it's still one point. Um, if, you're, if you have taken on roles, what's really important is that you clearly describe what it is you've done, what your exact individual contribution is, including sort of the time, the role, whether it's, you know, monthly meetings, whatever, quarterly meetings, um, so that actually it's clear for people who are reading your form to accurately assess what you've actually done. I mentioned that both research and publications and presentations the scoring has changed significantly over the past three years. Um, previously, people could get, um, could get scored for presentations and scored for publications separately. It's now all been merged into one form. 
And the reason for that was that there, there was felt to be a bias towards academic trainees who had done a substantive period of um, at a program for research and it significantly advantaged them. So that's now been removed. So I think what's important if you're looking at the scoring system for the publications presentations bit and that you think, oh, that you're probably a one or maybe, you know, you might be a two. Actually, an awful lot of people applying for grid will be falling into the two point category. There's relatively few individuals who will be scoring up on the threes and fours. So as I say, focus your energies where you're going to get maximal output. I would also add that anything you put in as publications gets checked. So we do look up um, what the publications are to ensure the accuracies, because occasionally things will not be quite accurate what's been put into the form. Um, I've commented previously, it's a competitive process. So last year we had 36 posts, as I said, this year we put 46, but I'm anticipating we're probably going to have at least another 20 applications. So I anticipate being given about 120 applications in the shortlisting process. Um, we shortlisted 65 people last year, and it's likely to be in that sort of number um, that we will be interviewing. I think when people worry about competition in terms of interview, I think it's important to know that actually we've significantly changed the number of individuals we interview. Um, it always used to be 45, but I increased it to 60 three years ago. We did 65 last year, and we'll probably do between 65 and 70 this year. Um, and that we reset the bar once shortlisting is over so that anybody who's shortlisted the shortlisting score does not count towards the final score and is only used to separate ranking if people have exactly the same scores. So we we shortlist quite a lot of individuals. So you know, um, and I think what's important to know is that there's no magic mark as to which shortlisting happens because the scores vary year on year. The real competition that you have are your fellow applicants. Um, I think there's some other individuals who are joining this evening who could personal experience of going through the process and will be able to talk in terms of how they develop their applications. I've, I've just shown you the competition ratio and that means that some people are not going to be successful. Some people won't get through shortlisting. And some people who get through shortlisting will not be successful at interview. I think it's really important to give yourself time to deal with your disappointment. After you've done that, it's important to reflect on the feedback. I think if you've not been shortlisted, you know, you will see what your scores were. And if you were unsuccessful at interview, there will be some direct interview feedback through the um, electronic system. I think it's always really helpful um, to take the time to get in touch with someone from CSAC. I often spend quite a lot of the, my year through February and March talking to trainees who've been unsuccessful um, and talking through the scoring system, discussing how they might be better able to develop themselves, looking at a subsequent application. And I think for anybody who's been unsuccessful, who feels very strongly about their commitment to neonatal medicine, particularly if you're sitting at ST6, then you need to very early um, be getting in touch with your TPD because in order to be eligible to apply again, you're going to have to have that 24 months um, from the time grid would start. So you would have to be looking at an OPP um, if you were to be able to apply again. Above all, I think be open to constructive feedback and actually use it to shape your next application. Um, one of my current STAs, who is utterly fabulous, was unsuccessful in her first application. She was very cross about it and very angry, and sent me some very angry emails when she'd found out she'd not been shortlisted. And I met with her several weeks afterwards because I said there wasn't any point meeting immediately because I didn't think it was helpful. And actually, by the time we'd met up, she'd gone through her form and she said she could understand why she'd got the scores that she had. 
And then she very interestingly said that her husband, who's a non-medic, had read through her form and had queried whether she'd actually answered the question. So as you're going through the process, think about who you're going to get to look at the form. People who are non-medics may actually be able to give you very good insight as to whether you have actually answered the question, even if they don't know much about um, practical neonatal procedures or other such things. And I think the really important thing is that just being unsuccessful once doesn't mean to say that you're not going to be successful the next time. It's about reflecting on what's happened and building on it for the future. Um, if you've not already been onto the subspecialty training pages on the website, I'd advise you that you get onto it. And I said, make sure that you've got that, the document for the 22-23 process um, downloaded so that you, you refer to it constantly as you're answering the questions. Um, because answering the questions without directly being aware of what people are looking specifically to attain certain scores, um, I think it's just not good planning. You, you need to understand what people are looking at and what is going to be regarded as the things that make a high quality answer. Okay, and I am going to stop sharing now. Maura, that's hugely helpful. Um, and uh, really just to go through the form and see where the points are, but also some really, really helpful feedback there, I think, on um, how to seek support and advice. Uh, and particularly, you know, if you don't get through, try, try again, but but get some feedback. And I know that you spend an awful lot of your time offering trainees that. So, yeah. And I think what I, I mean, the thing I would say very loudly and very clearly is that a lot of the trainees who have contacted me directly, who I've spent time with, have gone through their forms, we've discussed what they've had and not had, and also spoken about, you know, things like, how do what are the opportunities how can i develop this and sometimes it's sort of probably because i've got experience with this i've run, have run a very big department actually thinking about what the potential roles are where people can get themselves involved with um things that are going to enhance them and i would say that the vast majority of individuals that i've gone through the process with in terms of feedback and discussing how to optimise stuff for future applications have gone on and be, been successful. Yes, thank you. There was one or two questions. Uh, this one's come up a lot. Is there a word limit for the answers or a character limit? Do you know? I think there might be. I think there is. I think there is because or else some people would send us pages. Yeah. <laughs> You might have to wait for Oriel to come out, but I agree. Yes. Every time I fill out an abstract, it doesn't tell you until you're actually on the form um, what that word limit is. I mean, I think for now, you could start putting answers into boxes. Totally. Well, I was going to say, people can, if you yeah. look at the, the questions are there on the document, you know what the questions are going to be. So people can already start thinking about what they're going to put in, in terms of the various domains and I said it, it's about it takes a lot of work to do a good application um, and I said I think it's trying to get people not to fret about the fact that they're only going to get one point or two points in the publications presentation section because actually there's nothing you can do about that and you know the reality is you're much better focusing on the ones who are having a really good answer if you can push your points up across those domains. Um, and I said, you know, the reality is most people when it comes to the research and publications domain, the publications ones, I know the vast, probably the average score is between there. Um, somebody's commented, jo can I just, I was going to say, just looking at the questions in the chat, Joanna's asked about the level two competencies and the answer is um, you just need the supervisor to you just need to be on track because you your level two will be assessed at your ARCP in 2023. So you just need to be they need to be confident that you're on track. Yeah. There's another question um, that's been sent to me individually around 
Uh, I think the question is really around being clear on your contribution. So for instance, if you've organized a course, but you weren't delivering the teaching yourself, to me, that is still you having organized a course for local, regional or national. You know, you, you so, may have brought in expertise to give the lectures, but you've still organized the course. Would you so agree? Actually, that's, that's a really important thing. You know, it'll say, if you read the form, it tells you that, you know, leadership and management is about leadership and management and not about teaching. So often what happens is people will have organized, been doing teaching and stuff like that and will stick it into the leadership and management, which will not give them credit. However, if you managed... Uh, um, if you organised a meeting, you uh, you sourced the location, you organised the speakers, you put together a system in terms of obtaining feedback, you got feedback from those who attended it, then actually if you can clearly articulate that, and that's something that actually I would put into the leadership management domain as opposed, because teaching is about teaching. It asks you about sort of organizing teaching timetables so you can put stuff in if you've organized a teaching timetable, if you've um, arranged the topics to be covered and stuff like that. Um, what you want to do is to clearly articulate your role. Um, and I said it's acknowledging that in domains there are some domains you will score well in and there's some domains your score less well in, but actually that's the same for everybody. Yeah, absolutely. And the other thing I would think is to try and use different examples because that you're right, there may be, your leadership thing may be in postgraduate training of some description, but you probably don't wanna put the same thing in the teaching box as the leadership box. So when I write about that, or at least you need to argue different components. Of you need to be able to articulate if you're putting something into the leadership management book you need to be able to clearly articulate what kind of management responsibility was it so how were you a leader how are you a manager of whatever it is you're putting in there now there's a, another comment i'm seeing in the chat about if i have a quality improvement project that made a change in my department and i published it as a poster in our CPCH conference, can I use it in the publication? Absolutely, and the quality improvement section. No, no, you can use it in both, it's absolutely fine. You know, the whole thing is that what that, having it in your, if it's been published, if, if you had a poster presentation, then actually that's a presentation you've had and therefore absolutely should be in the publication section. And if it is a group project that you've clearly been involved in, had a major role, can articulate it well and can show change, which is the really important thing that I think everybody needs to be um, cognizant of. That I said, you know, then actually that would be a very good thing to put in as one of the things into your um, audit QI section. And I think the one thing in terms of the audit QI section is that it comments in terms of, you know, what it's looking for in the scoring system. You want to be able to articulate your role. You want to be able to clear about the change that's happened either in practice or an outcome, whether it's an audit or whether it's a QI. So rather than putting in stuff about 10 different projects that, that you provide minimal detail on, you know, if you provide three things where you can clearly articulate those things, that somebody like me can look at the section and be able to mentally take off as to, you know, these things have resulted in change, these have improved practice, these things have changed how the department does stuff, whether it's at a local level or even something's been changed and guidelines for the network has been altered. And if you use up all your words by putting in 10 things, then you, you don't get that um, clarity in terms of what your individual role is. And so the devil's in the detail really, isn't it, to a degree? Absolutely. And yeah. getting that across um, concisely and succinctly, I guess. And I, I think also when, you know, it's worth sort of stepping back from your application and thinking, if I was scoring it, what, how would I score this? Because I think the scoring system is your best friend, isn't it? 
really okay. thinking, have I answered? You know, where do I, how do I push that two to a three or that three to a four? That that's the strategic way I'm sure to approach the application form. I mean, the bottom line is I don't think anybody should fill out the form without the scoring system beside them. You just, I just, I yeah. don't think you can do yourself true justice. Now, the reality is I think people need to be truly objective about what their scores are going to be. And, you know, being objective, the reality is that in terms of the QI and audit, it may well be that actually you're only ever going to get a three with your best answer, and that's fine. You know, that it's about focusing your energies. As I say, you know, it's about being objective about what you've actually done. And if you've not done stuff, then you're not going to be able to get your score higher. But it's why in ensuring that the stuff you're filling in, doing that QI audits bit, and just clearly articulating what you've done, the changes and the outcomes, why that is so important. As I say, I, I sometimes will read answers and I will know individuals have done a lot, but they haven't clarified it. It's not clearly articulated. And I know that the, the, the point that they had potential to get and the points they actually got are probably um, different. So take somebody said, you know, examples you should have in each domain. Yes, two to three. As I said, if putting 10 in means you can't actually explain, then that's not particularly helpful. And I said, I think that anybody who's, you know, clear about the commitment to neonatal medicine, the clinical section, and the summary statement, because the summary statement is when I've ploughed through 75 applications and it's late on Sunday evening, I've spent all weekend doing shortlisting. I want to read that passion and commitment in somebody's summary statement that they tell me about how they've developed themselves, what they've done to, to develop their skills, to show their commitment. Um, and I want to be grabbed by the thought of, I'd love them to be my registrar. I totally agree. There's a lot of, a lot of power in a personal statement. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think I'll take this as the last question and you can see it on the, there's a lot about sort of quality improvement and audits. Do they have to be related to neonates? I would say the answer that's probably no, but, or not all of them. Really. It, it's, it's probably not all of them, but actually if you've only got stuff that's non-neonatal, then that for me is a bit of a red flag because it makes me ask, you know, so how has somebody gone through to the point of applying for a neonatal grid programme who's never been involved in any neonatal audit or neonatal QI project? Yeah, absolutely. And um, before we let you go, more, I just wondered if it's worth just touching on the, the interview process. So once people have heard about their interview, the interviews are done online, aren't they now? Yeah. Um, and, and there is a panel just just to sort of tell people the structure of the so, interview because a lot of the panel members that are trainees will have been on an old system face to face um you know do a quick make up a quick presentation and i know there's been quite a lot of change in that in recent years so yeah so in terms of you find out about being shortlisted for interview before christmas as i've said you will then as with previous years are able to book your interview slot as Callie said, it's online. So, you know, you need to ensure that you're somewhere where your IT setup is optimal, um, that you've got good broadband, that you're not going to have drop off and that you've got a good computer system to use. Um, it is a panel interview previously. Um, it was often a split panel. So there was two rooms that people would go into. Um, we do a straight panel with four members and we assess across four domains. We assess clinical reasoning, we assess um, research and academic ability, we assess team working and motivation and commitment to the specialty. So your questions are based across those four domains and you're scored on those. Um, and it's done as we said, it's online. It's a four person panel. So that does mean there are four different faces on the screen. 
Um, I think in terms of interview practice, I think interview practice is really important. I think it's also quite useful to do it um, using an online system where you've got different people asking different questions from different corners of your screen. I think getting used to that setup um, is a really good thing to do. Um, anybody going for any interview? Um, some people are naturally very articulate and will automatically be, sound really good, but actually everybody can be better, you know, in terms of doing practice and putting yourself out of your comfort zone. Because actually, if you're having interview practice, you want to do it with somebody who's going to give you honest feedback, who's going to give you the feedback that says, you know, you really didn't answer the question. Because actually, you want to learn how to be better. And sometimes those individuals are ones where you think, oh my gosh, they're a bit scary. So I'm not, I don't really want them to sort of critique my um, interview skills. But actually, practice makes an absolutely massive difference. Um, I said, I don't do interview practice for anybody applying for an NX because I, it, it's a conflict for me, but I do a lot of interview practice for people applying for all the subspecialty grids um, where I'm based locally. And, you know, because actually it's about getting people comfortable answering questions and practicing. And I said, I really do think that people need to put themselves out of their comfort zone. And actually somebody who's willing, I, to, I often do it one-to-one -one with people because if you're particularly nervous and you really are scared to be in a position in front of a full panel, if you know somebody is actually quite is good and would give firm and honest feedback, then ask to do sessions one-to-one -one and ask them to feedback, not just in terms of, you know, what you said was the answer, what was, what was good about the answer or also what needed improving and what could you do differently. Um, so, so the reality is, I said, so put yourself out of your comfort zone, practice, um, and practice with people who are going to give you honest feedback. It's like the form, somebody, if you want somebody to look at the form, not somebody who says, oh, that looks okay. Um, you want somebody to look at the form and says, I think that could be better. Lots of questions popping up in the chat about the panel. Yes, the panel consists of neonatologists from, across from across the UK. <laughs> yeah. uh, absolutely. The panel will not have seen your application form. So uh, it's, it's worth clarifying again, Morag, and I know you said this in your talk, that they are separate. So the form totally. and the interview are totally separate. The form only gets you shortlisted for interview and you are appointed based on your interview. That's right, isn't it? Totally. Yeah. And the only time that we look at the score is so as we interview, we interview on the scores, uh, we're doing it over three days. So we collate stuff across three days and people are ranked based on their interview performance. And the only time we look at shortlisting scores, if we end up that in place number 13, we have two individuals and we cannot split them across the domains of the interview, we would then go and look at the shortlisting scores. And if candidate B had a shortlisting score of 75 and candidate A had a shortlisting score of 69, then candidate B would be 13th and candidate A would be 4th. That is the only time we look at it. There's a comment about will we get an opportunity to discuss projects, research, and interview? It depends what question is asked. It may be something, if you're talking about motivation, that you can talk about, but I said it depends what questions are asked. Mm -hmm. And as I say, the, the, the panel, the application forms are completely separate from the shortlisting. We don't know your scores. Some of us on the panel will have shortlisted, but your forms are an anonymized. And to be absolutely honest, when you're going through 100 to 120 sets of applications, people will have absolutely zero memory of your written application.
Okay. And there's some separation, isn't there, between the panels who interview and those that shortlist. So I know I've been on the panel for interview, but I've, I don't shortlist. So, you know, yeah. they treat them as separate. I think that's really, really important. Um, thank you, Morag. That has been hugely helpful and uh, as ever. And uh, we really appreciate your time. And I hope you have a reasonable, because I'm not allowed to use the cute word, on call tonight. <laughs> So do I, so do I, and <laughs> I, said, I said best of luck to all of you with applications, um, look to put your best self forward, if things work out well then I will meet some of you um, for interview in January, if you're not successful then please get in touch, I won't organise anything until it doesn't happen until February, March because I have too much on, um, but I'm very happy to chat to people. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very Bye. much. Bye-bye. Bye. So lots and lots and lots of background there, lots of ideas, but now we're going to hear from some people who've done it and got on grid and, um, uh, and are going to share their experiences. And I'm going to hand over Ellie to Ellie to chair this session because I've got to go to GCSE Parents Evening <laughs> in about... 20 minutes, <laughs> uh, less than that actually. So um, uh, thank you so much to this panel that have come and joined us tonight to share their experiences because it's really, really, really valuable to hear from people who've done it and done it recently. Um, uh, and they're gonna uh, share some brilliant ideas, but also um, I think some inspiration, I hope, to how to make what you've done found great on your form because it's there's a skill to that and I think they're going to give you some examples of that today so uh handing over to Ellie thank you Ellie and uh um thanks all for attending and I will see you for the next one Brilliant. thank you Kelly um brilliant. so we've got now we've got three trainees and possibly a fourth one joining us but she's currently stuck in the for unit which is the job I guess um so she'll try and join us if, if she can um um just keep posting any questions you've got in the in the chat and we'll pause as we go along to try and answer the questions all right we'll start with Tash okay thanks Ellie hi everyone my name's Tash um I am just sharing my slides one minute so I am a current ST7 trainee at UCLH uh, in London and I am currently on maternity leave I've just had my first baby so um Bear with me. I did the neonatal application, I think it was in 2019, I want to say. That sounds about right. Sounds a long time ago. I started in 2020 on my first web post. Yeah, so I think that's about right. Um, so some of the things have changed a little bit, but I've gone by the current guidelines that are on the RCPCH website that I'm hoping that you guys have already had a look at. So um, I'm, the other people I've got on my slide here, Ali, Shavin and Bola, are other um, colleagues of mine who've recently done grid or are in the middle of grid um, and are going to give some of their insights as well. So in terms of the sections, so we've already gone through them really with more rags, so I won't uh, labour this point, but there are seven different areas on this um, form and I think that's one of the biggest things that I would echo with Morag is just really, really looking at that form and looking at it really honestly about where you are personally in that in that stage. And I've had a session with Ellie where we went through it bit by bit with her just to think about what exactly what stage she was at. So you need to do that. You need to sit down with yourself and say, what level am I? I understand that on this Zoom call, there are people from all the way from ST3 all the way through to ST6. So things are going to be very different when you look at that form. If you're sitting there at ST3 and you're, you're ahead of the game, you've got a little bit more time to play with to see where you can bump up those scores compared to somebody who's in ST6. They're in the, you know, um, the part latter part of their of their training now and they've got one time or maybe one more time after that to be able to do this application system so you need to weigh up where am I and what can I actually get points in so I'm going to focus on the first two bits of this um, uh, application so the clinical experience bit and the quality improvement and then I'll hand over to my colleagues to do the rest so these are just my general tips um, I think in terms of structuring your answers I think the key thing to remember is trying to base it around cases that you've seen is always useful because it just adds a bit of color to the story that you're telling 
as Morag says, she's going to read 120 applications that are going to read very similarly, especially in certain areas. For example, the clinical experience stuff, it's going to sound quite samey. So in some ways, you need to make it sound more interesting. And the way you do that is to frame it around real life examples. And with those, you want to think about what have you done? What did you learn from it? And how is it relevant to neonatology? And especially if you are applying a bit early, you may not have had as much neonatal experience. If your skills are not in neonates, you need to really relate how that gets back into neonatology. How is it transferable? Why is it relevant? Why are you writing about it? And I put there the rule of threes. That's one of my favorite things. If anyone who's had a mentoring session with me knows, I think that is a really useful way. Somebody asked, I think in this session, how many examples to use? Three is just a very, uh, it's a number that humans like. They like the number three. And so they respond positively to it, whether it's in an interview session or in a written application. So if you can try for each question to think of three main bullet points that you might want to get across. If you don't have three and you've only got two, that's fine. But the key thing is sometimes you might have been involved, as Morag says, in loads of different things, but you just need to pick out your top three. Those are the ones you need to focus on and write it properly so that it's clear what you did. Get opinions from people you trust and get opinions from people, as Morag said, who are going to be honest with you because that's what you need to do. I had one of my colleagues who's a consultant now read one of my applications and he absolutely ripped it to shreds. He was like, Tash, I know you and you just need to start again. This is just rubbish. <laughs> and I'm really grateful that he did that because there's no way that my application would have got me through shortlisting without his help, basically. Um, put your best achievements front and center. And that sort of goes on to my next point, which is avoid timeline answers. And we'll talk about that in a minute. And just be really honest and ruthless with yourself. As Morag said, don't sit there thinking, oh, I'll probably give myself a four for that section. It's sort of pointless. You need to say no. In black and white, I've got a two for this section. How can I get that to a three? Or how can I get that three to a four? You've just got to be really honest with yourself. And that will enable you to sort of work on the areas that you can work on. All right, so clinical experience. So I'm just going to read it out loud again. And the bit that I want you to focus on are the bits in bold. So describe your clinical experience to date and the skills you've acquired that are significant and specific to your subspecialty application, okay? And this is the, um, I'm just trying to minimize my screen. There we go. Okay, uh, the mark scheme, just to remind ourselves. And we're all aiming for boxes five and six. So that's what I'm going to focus on. And you can see here, it's more than two specific and significant examples with relevance to the subspecialty and your own development has been clearly explained with a patient-centered approach. So those, this is really useful. So I go through the mark scheme and highlight those key phrases because it will just focus your thinking when you're writing your application. There we go. So when I did this, we had a breakdown of actually the clinical experience question was broken down into three separate sections. I don't know if they're going to do this this time. You will only find out when Oriel opens. So you just need to read it very carefully. Um, but I had to break my answer down into a patient family centered approach bit that had 250 words in, 250 words on management of acute neonatal and pediatric emergencies and 250 words on practical skills. If they don't break it down into these three things, that's still okay because you can still use that as a bit of a framework because they definitely mention the patient centered approach in the blurb that they want you to talk about. So just remember that. And then the practical skills and management of acute emergencies, that's always useful in terms of showing your clinical experience in neonates or transferable skills. So we're gonna go on to some examples now. If you have a quick read, I'll read it out for you as well. But whilst I'm reading it, just think about whether you think this is a good answer, whether you think it's an okay answer and why you think that. So at ST1, I quickly gained confidence in resuscitating and managing floppy babies shortly after birth. During ST2, I worked at a tertiary surgical neonatal unit and was exposed to many complex surgical neonatal cases. I was able to recognize and act upon babies who presented with early signs of NEC, including recognizing a case with a rising glucose, falling sodium level on a night shift and taking initial steps to manage and stabilize the patient, whilst also involving my seniors and surgical colleagues early. Okay, so what do we think? I just, I'm gonna open the chat. What do people think this is good, bad? Just put in some thoughts there and see what you think. I'm just kind of scribbling if there's anything.
everyone thinks nothing. Non-specific, great. Yeah, average. Very good, nice, nice. This is, the, this is what I want, okay. So there are some good things about this answer and there's an attempt for a case-based answer because this person has talked about, you know, early NEC case that they've recognized. And it does clearly relate to neonates. So those two things are good. But as you said, it's quite vague. The case itself is quite vague. There's a lot of wasted words. And by what I mean by that is, if you've only got 250 words to sell yourself, don't waste time being like, at SG1, I gained confidence in doing this. Nobody cares. <laughs> That's not telling them anything, is it? And there's no clear focus on patient-centered care. So this is an example, um, another example. So, and then I want you to do the same thing, whether you think it's good, bad, et cetera. So as a registrar, I gained experience in, in, in independently managing sudden deteriorations and leading a team of juniors. During a night shift, a footling breech baby born at home came in to resuscitate ambulance severely unwell and acidotic. I led the resuscitation, supervised juniors inserting lines, initiated CFAM monitoring and therapeutic hypothermia. A mini KEX assessment particularly praised my delegation of roles and communication within the wider team. So again, if you wanna pop in the chat, whether you think it's good, bad, why, why you think what you think. Okay, very, very strict panel that I've got here. Shaban's been quite nice, well, that's nice. Um, essentially, uh, I think this one's a bit better because there's a much clearer description of the case and the evidence of personal development is slightly clearer as a leader. And by evidence, I mean that they've included this mini kex assessment. And I think obviously you're not gonna be able to show them that mini kex with your MSF or whatever it is that you put there, but using that, if you were lying would be a probity issue. So in a way you are providing some evidence to the, to the answer. And there are, I think, the, I think there are some wasted words. I don't think it's as bad as the previous one. Um, and there's more focus on, on the skills. I think with Jamie's thing that he was mentioning, doesn't mention specific skill sets. I think this person's talked about initiating CFAM monitoring and that they understand that lines have to go in and et cetera like that. Uh, this particular section was in the um, management of emergencies bit. So we'll talk about this one, which was coming out of, oh yes, yeah, so this was in patient-centered care. So neonatology can at times present very complex ethical dilemmas, which can be emotionally very difficult to all involved, including doctors and nurses. I've been able to be part of some difficult conversations in the past, in which priority must always be the best interest of the patient, whilst also taking into account the family's needs and wishes. Yep, so it's very vague again. Essentially, it's very general, isn't it? Again, the wasted words, very vague, generic. It tells you absolutely nothing about the candidate and it's not case-based. So it doesn't really tell you what is what, what have you gained from that, as, as exactly as Helen says. So this is a sort of different example. During an unexpected preterm delivery of a 23-week infant, I counseled the parents and my communication was prescribed in MSF as complete, calm, polite, and professional in approach, making the parents feel at ease during very difficult moments. I successfully delivered complex information whilst remaining empathetic to their individual circumstances. So if you compare that to the previous one, I agree it's still not a perfect answer. I don't know if it necessarily is one, but already it just, hones the person who's reading it down to okay 23 week infant the parents are going through something very difficult and this person was able to communicate with them deliver that communication and do it well as per the msf Ooh, sorry i keep losing the click so it's it's case-based and there's clear, clear relevance to niku and it's patient and family centered and one more example in this area so this one is under practical skills. So again, if it hasn't separated this in your um, in your actual application this time around, I think it's still worthwhile talking about your practical skills. Practical skills can be a bit more difficult to link to a case, but there are still different ways that you can do it. So for example, this one, I gained my competencies in ST1 during my first neonatal job, becoming quickly proficient with cranial ultrasound, administering surfactant and simple cannulation and venipuncture. 
During my time on a surgical tertiary unit, I was able to become familiar with a wider range of vascular access procedures, including UAC, UBC, and insertion of long lines. So it's, it tells us some stuff, but again, how much do we talk about practical skills that would be expected as part of normal peace training? Um, so as I said, on my application form, when I did it, I had to write a separate section about just practical skills that you can include anything in, but you'd have to make it relevant to neonates. Why do you think that that is relevant and why are you mentioning it basically? So for example, in my one, I did write about suturing because I, and then I related that to securing lines on the neonatal unit, but otherwise, you know, you don't need to talk about gluing heads or whatever, or scalps when you're in the pediatric a &E that you might do. Uh, so, sorry, going back to this example, um, again, it's not case-based, it's vague and unfocused, saying things like, oh, I became familiar with a wider range of vascular access procedures, doesn't really tell me what that means. Can you do it independently? Can you not? Are you still working on it? Can you teach other people? And from, this is another example. So instead it says, from a respiratory perspective, I'm confident in interviewing preterm and term neonates under elective and emergency circumstances. I'm able to perform medial thoracocentesis independently and have had experience in certain chest rings. I'm able to manipulate ventilator settings in response to blood gases and am familiar with various types of ventilation, including high frequency oscillation and conventional ventilation, including pressure support and volume guarantee. So why do you, what do you think about this? This one. Any thoughts? Yeah, so it's much more structured. So it's system based and it's active. So it's very first person description of the abilities. And there's a comfortable use of NICU language, which obviously implies experience. So whoever this is, has worked on a neonatal unit. And you know that because by when you're reading it, the way they're talking about HFOV, conventional ventilation, pressure support, volume guarantee, you would only really know those things if you were on a unit and you've been on it quite a lot and worked on them and had some experience in that. And I agree with uh, somebody who said, uh, Katie, I think it was, who's, it's not example. So it's still not case-based. So it depends on uh, your structure of your if of your um, application form this time. If it's just a blank sheet that just says, tell me about your clinical experience in 500 words, then you're gonna have to use two to three examples and work in your practical skills into the case-based discussion. But if it breaks it down into, please tell me about your practical skills, then you can probably be a bit more relaxed about not using a case-based discussion in this bit but using it in your other sections. So in the family-centered care, in the management of neonatal emergencies, for example. And uh, before we move on to the next section, I'm going to tell you now <laughs> that all of these examples, which is why Shavin was so nice about them, were from my uh, application. So the first, the ones that are not so good were from my very first draft of writing my application. And then the second answer was from my final draft that I submitted and got me shortlisted with quite a high score. So there you are. Um, any questions before we move on to section two? Sorry, I'm, I'm going quite quickly because I'm, I'm aware that- yeah, There was a question um, from uh, Vijay Kumar. Um, I might just yes. answer it, but it was- um, Yeah, go for it. You know, can we highlight courses we attended, um, like cranial ultrasound and echo course? Um, what I was told is um, anyone can attend a course and that doesn't necessarily give you any marks. The most important thing is show, show how that has changed your practice, how that has made you a better doctor. So in itself, the simple statement saying I attended a course, it, you know, doesn't add to your um, application. Um, so show how that changed your improved your um, your practice. Um, I just want to say, you know, Tash's exam examples are very impressive. Um, don't need to have done chest drains, um, uh, you know, needle thoracocentesis, um, and all those sort of things. You, you're not going to be the finished article. Um, I I definitely didn't have those on my um, 
my section one and I still scored full marks. Um, the question does ask about pediatric and neonatal. So, you know, managing a resus, if it's a pediatric resuscitation, there's a lot of coordination and, you know, challenging medicine, which goes on in there. So, um, you know, really good examples by Tash, but I just wanted to say, actually, you're not meant to be the finished article applying for this. So, um, and um, for Vijay Kumar, don't just write, I've done a course. Yeah, that's super helpful, Shavin. Um, I would totally agree. Like, I've just pulled out for the second bits of my examples, the sort of better bits of my applications to directly contrast with what the first bit, my first draft was. Um, but definitely don't be put off by the idea of like, oh, I haven't done all of those things. I was like weirdly obsessed when I was in SG4 that I hadn't done a peripheral arterial line. I don't know why I was really obsessed with that. And I was like, I haven't done one, but actually why would you have done one? It's not important. That's what you're gonna go into grid training to do. So yeah, definitely agree with Shavin. Any other comments or thoughts on section one or questions before we move on to the next bit? I can't see okay. any more questions in the chat. Perfect. So um, quality improvement and audit. So I think this is a bit that what they're really trying to get to the bottom of is, do you understand the quality improvement and audit process? And if you do understand it, how much have you been involved with it during your training so far? Show it to them. And you, so you need to, that's what this long bit here is trying to get. You need to provide evidence that you've identified an opportunity for QI, you had and a level of involvement in it and you manage to change something and how you learned about it. So you need to think about that carefully. And I think as we talked about with Morag, two or three examples that are high quality are much, much more effective than 10 examples where you were just got data collection. So you need to write them down. And what I did when I first thought about it was wrote, wrote down all the things I'd ever been involved in, even if it was a tiny little involvement, you know, oh, I just data collected for that national project or whatever it was but I basically didn't do anything else just write it all down so that you're clear about what you've done and then whittle it down to two maybe three that you are proud of and that you feel like you understood the project from start to finish and you understood something you learned something from that project that's what I would pick so what we'll do is we'll go through oh sorry so here we go the reminder of the mark scheme and you want to, to get full marks, you need to have evidence of having designed and led more than one good quality project with a clear description of subsequent change in the practice or guidelines, and it's been adopted at either regional or national level. That's tricky, but I think more or less everyone should be able to have involvement probably at two or three. So you're either gonna have local practice or guidelines. Most people will have got something here. Um, but if you're only in two, that's okay. But I think the difference between two and three, let's have a look. So it says evidence of having designed and led food quality project with a clear description of findings um, and change. This one's led more than one. So if ideally you've done more than one project and you just need to make sure that you've picked two projects which are very clear. So what are the QI principles? I think, the structure of your answer, you've got a few options. You can either go with a plan, do, study, act cycle, the PDSA cycle. You can do it in a bit of a researchy type way with a bit of background methods, results, and change implemented. Or you can do it in the very sort of, this is how I like to think of audit and quality improvement. It's like, I saw a gap, I saw a problem. I did some baseline data collection. I reviewed why that problem was there and then I implemented some change. So I personally like the third one, but you can use any structure as long as you stick to it and it's clear and it doesn't involve too much waffle. I think sustainability and quality improvement, I'm particularly passionate about that. It's no point if one trainee comes in, does something and then, it, and then it's forgotten about when that trainee rotates on. And I think sustainability has become quite a high, hot topic, should I say, in quality improvement. So if you can consider how you can prove that your projects have been sustainable, that will probably look quite impressive on your application form. Uh, fine, so I'm gonna work through one of the examples that I included in my one. So I've written, following the observation of poor prescribing practices on a neonatal unit in a district hospital, I drove a quality improvement project to establish the current problems and to improve prescribing. I should point out 
this project happened in Myanmar when I was volunteering abroad with the Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health. So don't be alarmed by what comes next. So medications were written on a loose piece of paper in the notes and no drug charts were in use. I designed and conducted a baseline audit drawing standards from the UK hospitals and the GMC and found serious gaps, demonstrating that only 20% of prescriptions had a correct dose and only 5% were signed and dated. So I've included this to show you the first, um, the first sentence is just a framing of like what I think is good about this. And then the next bit is talking about what the problem was so the medications were just written on bits of paper and then I've explained that I understand you need to get some data a baseline data using standards again the word standards I know it all sounds very simple but actually if you use the words used commonly in order and quality improvement it makes you sound like you know what you're talking about so serious gaps and then I had some baseline data so working with the senior consultant team, we discussed barriers to improvement using the fishbone model. So the fishbone model is a type of root cause analysis and it's a very useful tool in quality improvement. I'm sure lots of you know about it. But again, using that term in your answer makes you sound like you've done it loads, loads before and you know how to perform root cause analysis or at least you've had experience doing it before. And again, in that one sentence, by saying working with the senior consultant team, I've also implied that I understand you need to get major stakeholders involved when it comes to quality improvement. We decided to introduce drug charts, hold intensive teaching sessions for the doctors and nurses, and to include drug charts and junior doctor induction. So again, I've, I've said these are my interventions, and it's not just one intervention, it's lots of interventions. And again, sometimes when you use the fishbone model, it's useful to think about things as a multifaceted problem. So it's never just one problem. It's never just one lazy person or one person or one printer that's broken. It's often lots of different things that are, are creating a barrier to ideal care. And if you then have lots of different interventions, it shows that you know that. And then a repeat audit two months later demonstrated improvement to 50% with correct dose prescriptions with, and for 85% of prescriptions that were correctly signed and dated. This project was presented at the regional cluster meeting in Mandalay. So that bit at the end is showing that I understand a PDSA cycle is a cycle. I need to repeat the data that I collected to prove that the change that I've implemented has made a difference. And then I want to share that learning with other people and that's what that last sentence is for this project was presented so that you can explain that you understand that once you've done this great project you need to share that learning with other people that's the best part of quality improvement is that you can share that learning with other people um so i'm critiquing my own work here so people please chip in if you think there are things that could be better um i think it's got a reasonable structure because i've identified a problem we've investigated it We've done some salient data points are included, and then there's some clear interventions. We've re-audited and then presented the results. And then um, I've clearly indicated my own level of involvement. So what exactly did I do at each step of the way? Um, so those would be my main points. I, um, I have another example, but I'm not sure it's going to add anything more. And I kind of want to give Shavin and other people an opportunity to speak. I'm just reading the comments box. So just do drop any questions in there. Katie's asked, how anonymized do things need to be? Um, I think the answer to this um, is, it doesn't have to be that anonymized in terms of obviously nothing, patient confidentiality that goes without saying should be confidential. But in terms of which hospital you worked at and where you did things, I don't think it needs to be that anonymized. Um, I certainly mentioned by name hospitals that I'd worked at in London in my application form. I don't think it matters. It shouldn't, dis, it shouldn't um, disadvantage you in any way. And it certainly doesn't say that you have to anonymize things on the application process. And then Bol has written, Bol has written a couple of things which are relevant to the next couple of sections we're gonna do after this. Any uh, other questions? I, I would just read? say, uh, yeah. I, did the, I did the opposite actually. Um, I did not write my name in the application or any um, of the hospitals I worked in, I just described it as a, uh, you know, a tertiary neonatal unit with surgical cardiac or something like that. So I don't think there is a right or wrong uh, way of doing it. It definitely isn't made explicit how you should do it. Um, and I guess obviously definitely no patient specific information, but um, that was just how I wrote it. Mm. 
Um, any other questions about quality improvement and the audit bit? I had three different audits I talked about. Two of mine were from Myanmar. One of them was from a hospital in the UK. And I think they were all neonatal. But as we've talked about with Morag, they don't all have to be. She sounded quite scary. She was a bit like, if you haven't done a neonatal project, I'd be worried. But I do think it is valuable if, you, if your third project maybe is still pediatric and you think you can relate it to neonates, you know, it's still worth putting in there. Any other questions about QI? Otherwise, we'll move on to the next bit. Nothing coming up in the chat at the minute. Anyone else? Questions? Or if you want to unmute, anyone want to ask directly? I think I've talked enough. <laughs> Should we move on? People don't need to read my application process anymore now. <laughs> Um, so Ali, I don't think has been able to join us. I assume she's been still stuck in the NICU. Um, yeah. do, did you have, Tash, you had a couple of, because the next sections, the next two sections on leadership and research, Ali was going to go through. Did you mm. have her examples? Should we? Yes. Michael, do, Shavin, do you want to switch to yours? You can. Um, whatever's quickest, I don't mind. Um, yeah, I was going to do a publication and education bits, so... Um, um, no. I can share her slides, but Shavin, why don't you do your bit? Yeah. Because then we can put hers up at the end, can't we? Do you want me to share the slides from my screen, Shavin? Yeah, please. Perfect. Oh, Sue's got her hand up, Ooh. or his hand up, sorry, I don't know. Hi, uh, sorry, quick question. For example, um, the QI project that you've just given us the example, Tash, you've yeah. uh, presented it, or say, for example, it's got published. So would you... Is it okay to include that in the publication as well and speak about it in your research bit? Uh, so I think it is okay. I think if you're going to talk about it, though, you don't want to just repeat yourself. That's the main thing. So you have to tease out what the publication process, how it was separate from your quality improvement. So you could, in the quality improvement, you could present it as I have, so the PDSA cycle. And then in the presentation bit, I suppose you could talk about um, the quality improvement project on this that changed that instituted this change was presented at this meeting um for x y and z and we were able to do it as a first person publication and i learned x y and z about it so i think you'd have to somehow relate it to how you learned about the publication or research processes that is slightly different from quality improvement does that make sense i mean ellie might disagree with me but... okay thank you got it Okay. So, so uh, hi everyone. It's great to see so many people on the call. So my name's Shavin. I'm currently an ST7 grid trainee working at George's. Um, so yeah, thank you, Tash, for your um answers. And I think that's really, really kind of you to be so honest about your own writing. Um I'll go through publication and education and the um last section, which is I think um basically a statement to support your application. So um, once you get onto Oriel, this bit is fairly linear. Um, essentially, there'll be boxes for you to put in and populate. Um, so there isn't much you can do to um, you know, vary or change what you write. It's essentially um, title, PubMed ID. Um, there will be a section which you can make it very explicit what this is. So for example, this is a um, oral poster presentation at an international conference um, and definitely use, you know, the language which will score you the marks. Um, and I think that's pretty much all you can put in there. Um, points which have been covered before definitely use, um, it, you know, basically put everything in is what I did, which would be um, neonatal and non neonatal things. Um, and I think you know, as Morag said, they're obviously looking for neonatal things in this section, but actually the, the specific mark scheme doesn't say it has to be, you know, a, um, a peer reviewed uh, in a neonatal um, case report or uh, in a neonatal journal. So please do um, put everything in there. Um, there definitely isn't negative marking or anything like that. Um, so first point is, um, you know, put everything in. Um, most people from the questionnaire that was sent round are applying in this window. 
Um, so I, I wish someone you know really did labor this point to me, but there's nothing you can do to change what you're going to score in this section in the next three or four weeks. Um, so I think just accept it, put that there and, um, you know, not everyone's going to be scoring full marks and most people will be scoring sort of in the two category. So, uh, and that's quite normal. I scored um, three out of six. It was slightly different, our scoring system. Um, I just want to make a quick point on people who are applying in the following year. So the 2023 to 2024, obviously you have a year to um, achieve these goals. Um, so definitely have a look through, um, you know, quick wins are looking through things like BMJ case reports, um, archives, the fetal and neonatal edition have a images section. So, you know, that will probably fall under the case report bit. Um, BMJ, um, you know, education and practice, you can publish your QI work in VAS as well. Um, and also BMJ, um, you know, ADC archives in disease and childhood has things like an Archimedes section where you can do uh, like a PICO question and a literature search and literature review. So definitely go through the common journals, which go through your front door, have a look and think, can I do that? Um, at the very least, you need to be looking at getting a two, you know, the case reports and things like that and your poster presentations. But if you've got the time for next year, obviously, that, that's um, trying to bump up your mark. Um, and I think, you know, the main thing I want to labor on this section is there's nothing you can do in four weeks to change your mark. Um, so try your best to focus on the other sections where you can definitely change your mark. I thought I would just um, mention what I put in my application just to kind of um, basically say, you know, not everyone has loads and loads of uh, research and publications. So I had a, a case report um, and I was the first author for that. Um, I had a kind of a QI project, which was published in archives, and I was a co-author. Um, I had a international poster presentation about um, art therapy. And I think, yeah, and then I had some stuff about what I did as an undergrad as well. Um, so, you know, um, it's not it's not a lot, um, but I just wanted to kind of give you a flavor there. Um, for what I'd done. Um, I didn't have much more to say on the publication presentation bit um, because I think it's essentially the most straightforward part in that there isn't much you can do um, differently. Um, were there any questions um, on that? So we've not got anything yet. Oh, there's one there from Katie. Uh, you don't include... You, you do you do have to uh, so obviously this but you actually can't anonymize um you you have to sorry the uh, uh the list of the authors let me see what so, I, uh, so shavin um i remember basically when i uh, when you apply basically you put a star in the place of where your name appears in that list of authors. right yeah so if you're first author you put star and then all the other authors appear there then it's in a completely separate section so it's not like you don't have to put this in a blurb. There's like a separate section being like title, author, blah, 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 for each of your publications or posters or whatever it is. Does that make sense, Katie? Yeah, okay. And that's um, one thing Bolla has actually said in her message was to make sure that you write the exact title and citation to make sure you get all the marks, as you said. Yeah, that's what Bolla said. Don't lose out on what you've got. When you just wanted to make a comment that actually I think Ali's also put in her slides is that when you write about your publications or your your research um, stuff, try and use the language that shows that you're involved in, in critical appraisal, even if you don't have that much to write about it. So, for example, mentioning whether you've done the GCP um, certification just to make sure that you understand that you've been involved in maybe recruiting patients if you've been on a tertiary neonatal unit that does studies, et cetera. Um, it won't get you points necessarily, but it still implies a degree of understanding about the research process alongside, obviously you mentioned the other things that you have done, but yeah, can be useful to talk about those things. I think people get really, really hung up on this bit. Um, yeah, so just reading um, 
um, this question. So did you include everything? Um, I mean, so I, I think um, this section is a section which is, it's not free text. It's essentially, as Tash has written, you've got um, a title, um, author, a, a section for, it's really um, prescriptive. And I think, um, you know, you, you can definitely, you definitely just need to put your best foot forward, you know, the things which are your first authors and, um, you know, things which will get you the marks. Um, I mean, I, I would say, you know, if you've, if you've got it, use it. Um, and, you know, there isn't any sort of negative marking. I mean, there will obviously be people sitting in this, um, this call who've got hundreds of things. Um, so I suppose for me, that wasn't really very, um, that wasn't a problem that I had. Um, so I think my answer would be definitely put the most um, high scoring points there. And if it's something you did at med school, and it's kind of like a, a, a local thing, um, you know, maybe that's something which doesn't add to it. But um, like I say, it's you can it, I don't think it was uh, limited um on that section on what you could put I think it was like an endless populated that it was like add another line if you wanted to add another thing so as far as I'm concerned you could add everything to be honest I guess not to waste your own time once you've achieved the top fit like score that you're going to achieve don't spend ages just plugging in more stuff that's irrelevant that would be my advice If there are no more questions, um, Ellie, could you go on to the next slide, please? Um, so education, this section, um, I think um, a lot of points have been echoed already. Really read the question. Um, almost to a point where you should be underlining it, having it side by side. Um, What's really useful, uh, if you haven't already seen, there's a glossary of terms. So, for example, you might be thinking, what does designed and, and delivered mean, actually mean? Um, and if you refer to the um, glossary of terms in the application pack, it will tell you exactly that. Um, so you're not less left guessing. So um, first point for this, this question is, as been, has been said before, have the question mark scheme and the glossary of terms um, so you know exactly what you're writing. Um, advice I was given um, for this section. So um, when we were applying, it was 300 words. So obviously you can't put everything you've ever done in this section. Um, give your devote your word count to the most um, you know powerful examples that you have um, and you'll have to make some tough decisions because there'll be some things which you're really proud of um, and there'll be some things which will uh, score you the points so I think that's where you have to make those difficult decisions you know that regional um, teaching example will score something over you know the thing which you know, I mean, hopefully you can put in both, but the point should be clear that you can't put everything in there. So the examples um, that I had used, um, so I, I had designed um, a mock um, clinical examination OSCE. Um, so I talked through that and I devoted a sort of paragraph to that in my answer. Um, and I was, the feedback I was given was really use the language of I led, I designed, use um, my my friend and mentor who helped me. She said, use the power words, you know, words which really make you stand out. Don't sell yourself short. Um, and really talk about, you know, um, how you organized, you know, things. Um, I'm being careful not to step on the other section of organization and management, but um definitely um you know use the language um which really sells yourself um the other thing which i would recommend as, as a top tip is look through your cv so you've got you know probably about six years worth of um experience um and just because you did it in your st1 or your f2 doesn't doesn't devalue it i mean i think what tash said is you don't waste word count saying in my st1 i did this because that um doesn't add anything um just say what you did um but pull out your cv look through it um and i think as doctors sometimes we can be quite um you know negative about our own cv i, I think there are definitely things which if someone else looked at my cv they would think that's a really good thing you should put that on um so look for your cv pull it out make sure you use 
all your examples um which you know are relevant to this section but bear in mind you can't put everything down um i think the other thing is um sort of evidencing points so i think tash in her examples did this um and what i mean by that is um look through your um msfs and look through your um maybe some things like cbds and sles um i think it's more uh, relevant for the um patient-centered approach, but I did what Tash did and I used direct quotes or if I got a, a card from a family or things like that. Um, so probably not super relevant for the education section, but I think what I did is um, I might have had an example about cranial ultrasound scanning and then I um, uh, and then I think I got some feedback about, you know, a, a teaching program thing um so I, I kind of lifted the direct text i used i used um quotation marks to kind of you know really um um make it obvious um that this is the feedback i got from doing this um piece of education and um things like that um for people applying in 12 months time i would definitely recommend um you know doing your gic um so um i think probably everyone knows what that is, but you have to do an NLS course and be nominated, do your GIC um, after that. And um, if you've got the 12 months ahead of you, then definitely do that. Um, do your NLS early if it's not out of date. Um, it's, you know, it's one point at which is possible to do. Obviously, if you're applying in this window, that's something you can't uh, necessarily change. Um, that's all I had for education. Um, <coughs> any questions? Uh, no, just to echo what you said, Shavin, I also brought my NLS forward. I think it was only two, two years into my four year, whatever. And I knew I wanted to get IC'd for it. And I was already an APLS instructor. So I just brought it forward and then told them upfront, I really would like to be an NLS instructor nominated and then you can just write it I've just read my at application for grid and actually it just says I was nominated for NLS ICs I'm still in the process of completing them but I'd already done GSE so I think that already gives you the points so you just make sure you, you do that it's easy points we had a bit in our application which um, essentially was something related to COVID-19 um, and I think Bola has made a, um, a point to that so it actually um, I don't know if it's still in in the application but for example for abstracts and conferences which were delayed um you could put it's been accepted um but the conference hasn't gone ahead because of covid and i think there's a similar option to do that for things like gic um so i think bol has mentioned that i don't know if that still holds true uh, it might be worth just really looking through that it's just something else i've noticed um in my application um do you think yes that jamie yeah is my answer <laughs> yes it counts um shavin and ellie i've just looked at ali's bits and she's actually done a slide on every section so the only she's only got one slide on leadership and management so i think she's happy probably for us to talk about it more generally um if we want okay um was that the only section we have left I'm you want to do the should we go to that first and then leave the statement of support at the end does that make sense yeah let's finish it off so do you, uh if has she got anything specific or i can go back back to the leadership um yeah. i think go back to the leadership thing yeah. i think essentially what she's got is three let me, uh, uh, shall I just quickly share what she has? Yeah, sure. Let me stop this. Mm -hmm. no, that's the wrong thing. That's the wrong one. So she's just got these three examples. And I think essentially what she's trying to demonstrate with these is there's three levels here, isn't there, of what you could write for the leadership and management bit. You could just write, I've been on the whatever committee since 2020. That's not going to get you many points. I have been on X committee that has been involved in X project. That'll get you a bit more points. But then a proper answer would be as part of the FMLMD fellowship, I have developed skills, including people management, effective communication and conflict resolution. So you can see she's effectively told me 
what have I learned and what have I developed in myself from the committee fellowship that I've been part of. I have taken these skills and used them in my role on the so, so and so committee where I've been able to lead on this project. This has led to real change and improved outcomes for patients. And I overcame challenges in this project by. So yeah, this is a really nice example actually of, of three, of potentially having the same information but presenting it in such a way that you're gonna get so many more points if you talk about it as this third, in this way in the third line. Uh, and then we can probably go back to you, Ellie, if we then just talk generally about the leadership stuff. Just pulling up my own application to look at that bit. <laughs> Sorry, that's just a general slides. There's nothing, no examples on that. Um, is there any questions specifically for, I guess maybe we just say the leadership and management section. Stuff that I put in, I put in things about, I was an m, &M coordinator at one of the, one of my pediatric reg jobs. And then I talked about how in particular, what I learned about that and why it was good. I was a trust rep at a couple of places, and I also put in that I was the treasurer of surgical society at university, because once upon a time, I was convinced I was gonna be a brain surgeon. Uh, but during the treasurer of surgical society, I like organized some conferences and things like that. So those are the kinds of things I put in. I don't know about you, Shavin. Um, examples I put in, so I, um... I'd done a lot of work um, with waste reduction in um, the hospital I worked in, um, which was at Leeds General Infirmary. So that was a big thing for me in that I um, spoke to hospital managers, non-clinical staff, clinical leads. Um, we were essentially trying to reduce blood tests and bits and pieces. So that's something which I um, spoke a lot about in my application. Um, and I think it's something which... Um, in hindsight, probably I might have spent a bit too much time spending talking about that. I think similar things, um, what uh, what Tash has mentioned, um, talking about you know um, working as as part of parts of teams. So that could be M and M, or um, I was part of a, an antimicrobial group, um, guideline development groups. Um, I think everyone has done some road design or something. So definitely put a bit of that in I definitely only spend one one sentence on that because everyone will have something similar um and I think what I try to do is uh you know showed how that I think you have to have a definition in your mind of what management is and what leadership is um so um almost annotate this question to say this is what I understand by leadership and management I mean in reality there's a lot of overlap between the two terms um and then you know, make sure that once you've listed example X um, as illustrated, you use um, you use those words to kind of really say what you've learned from it. Um, I think this is definitely a section which you can um, you should spend a lot more time than you probably were planning on um, to really bulk up your answer. We we were scored out of six, I think, for this one, um, so it's a slightly different um, number than previous. There's a specific question about out things outside medicine um, and also a question about being a local trainee lead of neo trips or reach does that count so i think that i i did talk about stuff outside of medicine um as well as outside of neonatology so i i was quite passionate about um working in low resource settings and i'd done a little bit of work in that um that you know so i had put a little bit about that in um specifically I'd worked as an expedition medic um we'd done some stuff about water and sanitation and hygiene and things like that um so I, I, I think there is value in putting things which are non-neonatal that's my personal feeling um I think stick to Tasha's rule of three so maybe just uh, make sure you you tick the top scoring boxes but don't put too many things in um and you know, I, I think there's a temptation to list things, um, you know, try and avoid that. You know, I did this, I did this, I did yeah. this. I want to say, 
what I learned from this. Um, and that can be hard to do if you've got a lot that you want to say, but that's the brutal truth. Lists probably won't score you points. Um, three really well um, developed examples will get you the points. So definitely um, trust uh, trust me. I completely or, uh, agree because you know it yeah. says there demonstrating regular contribution and commitment clearly described with the evidence of the impact they've made. So it doesn't matter what your um, thing is if it's from you know organizing your local football team that's absolutely fine if you can tell tell me as a as a person reading your application why that's relevant to you being a good neonatal registrar then do it you can tell me about that um i think it's totally relevant and again with vijay kumar's question as but uh, sorry about sorry bass's question i think definitely if you're a local lead of neotrips it definitely counts it just it's all about how you sell it so what did you learn by being the neotrips lead why is that relevant? Why do I care about that? Is it because you had to corral lots of people into data collecting for you? Is it because you had to liaise with people on committee? Is it, you know, what is it about that role that makes it relevant to you being a good neonatal registrar? Why do they want to take that skill that you've learned from there into their neonatal grid program? Um, uh, somebody's messaged me separately being like, shall we just talk about the last section, the personal statement? Because I think a lot of people worry about that bit. I think it's getting quite the time to be late. You've it's obviously got late, a little yeah. one who wants you. <laughs> um, so uh, we can ask sort of general questions at the end. Um, should we skip over to this section? Because we've probably covered it quite a lot with the public. Yeah, I think we've section. covered that. Um, uh, and I think it's this bit that, like you say, everyone's quite anxious about. Yeah. Shavin, did you have any? Yeah, I just, I just quickly answer um, Vijay Kumar's question. Um, I think um, the general answer to that is um, the, the way it's marked is um, the uh, each section will be marked. So for example, Morag will probably mark, for example, all of question one, two and three, for example, uh, or something like that. So no one sits down and looks through your application from question one to six or however many questions it is. Um, and the point I'm trying to make is treat each question as a standalone answer. So for example, if you have done something guideline related, which might be a really good, I mean, definitely put that if you've got a publication from it in the publication section, um, it might be that you've got a really good management experience from that guideline thing. So put it in there. And then it might also be something which, um, you know, a statement to support your application. Um, so. I think, you know, the question you've asked, what section does it go into? It depends, um, but also treat each answer as a standalone answer. Obviously be careful not to use the same thing over and over again, but you might have an example which can be used in more than one section. So um, it might not um, be, you know, the yes, no answer you're looking for, Vijay Kumar, but I think um, it's something um, which that, that's my advice on that. Um, so for the last question, definitely one of the harder sections um, and the thing you want to spend the most amount of time on. Um, I think the key in, in the in the context of only, you know, being 740 and people probably wanting to head up, I would just um, give my kind of take homes. Um, so, you know, why neonatology? Um, and you need to demonstrate you have an understanding of the subspecialty. Um, so look up the um, subspecialty um, thing on RCPCH. Um, don't, um, I think Morag mentioned this, you know, I think there's this uh, temptation to say, I want to be a super neonatologist who can echo and do respiratory and do palliative care. And, you know, I think it's so much better to have a personal interest uh, which you clearly explain as opposed to trying to say I want to do all these different things because in reality um, you know you won't be able to do all the things that you want to you have to really hone it down in your subspecialty training um, by that I mean you know you might have ideas of I want to do transport I want to do get experience of ECMO I want to get experience of palliative care and you will have to some degree but I think um, you know, if you're going to talk about an interest, um, devote your word count to a specific interest and not try and dilute it with many interests. Um, but I would say put an area of interest within neonatology in. Um, 
definitely focused on neonatal examples for most of this question. Um, but I was told you also probably want to um, show that you are a well-rounded individual. So um, you do have, um, you know, experiences and passions outside of neonatology. Um, so I think that was some advice I was given. So I did have a one-liner of a, a good example, which I think um, kind of ticked the box of making me look good, but wasn't very specifically neonatal. Um, and yeah, what I think what I used in that was working in lower resource settings. Um, so that was my um, my bit I put in there. Um, I used this section to um, tell tell my story. I think um, so. I've read quite a few people's applications before, and I think they write what they think wants to be read. Um, and I think what's better is writing an honest application about why you want to do neonatology. Um, and I think that's it for me in terms of advice. Um, I had one um, final slide, uh, Ellie, if you could go on to um, the next slide from here, um, which I think really um, were my sort of top take homes. And I think um, you've got about four or five weeks to write your answers now. Um, log on to Oriel. Um, I think you can definitely register for Oriel before you can populate it. So definitely register for it. Sometimes it lets you go on to it. Um, and although you can't write the answers, you can see the questions. And the thing you really want to know is the word count. So we had 600 words for the statement to support your application. Uh, it could be it could be shorter, it could be longer. Um, I definitely start writing it now. Um, I think, um, you know, get a consultant to look through it, get a grid training to look through it and get someone non-medical to have a look through it. But definitely give them the time they would, you would, you, you know, you would spend yourself reviewing it. So you can't ask them to do it, you know, two or three days in advance. And obviously you're going to make changes and you might want to send it back to them. So, um, yeah. And you can definitely write one answer and send that, you know, um, chop it, chop it up a little bit. So, you know, question one, you can just send it off and get that feedback um, um, sooner rather than later. Um, and I think, yeah, you know, have a look through. These are my sort of top tips, which I uh, I thought, you know, people um, should have a look through. And, um, you know, um, I think, um, yeah, Ellie and Tash, if you had anything you wanted to um, um, add into that last section. Um, Um, yeah, sorry, I was just depositing my baby with my husband. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I think in terms of that last section, I think everyone stresses about it for good reason, because it is the only place in the whole thing where you can really show your personality. It's a bit of the, like somebody said to me, this is the place where you put all of your nerdy passion for neonates. And they're totally right. This is where you sell it to them and tell them, why do you want to do this? as Shavin said, and it's the place that you can have a bit more freedom to talk about it because everywhere else has been prescriptive. You're trying really hard to get 0.3 or 0.4 or 0.5 out of six points or whatever in each section. And here you've got free reign, which is both a blessing and a curse. So you need to still remain quite focused. What are your three main things that you want to get across to them? Just like I said, the rule of three still applies, still applies here. And for Shavin, it sounds like that was, you know, his, um, low resource setting work and I also having volunteered in Myanmar that was a big part of my personal statement as well but there are there must be a couple or three things that you think about yourself that make you stand out from other people so this section just involves a lot of soul searching you need to sit down as Shavin said look through your CV and say what on my CV and what about me is different from the next person and why, how do I get that across to the, the panel who's going to be reading my application for you? Um, and completely agree with Shavin. Don't write down you're going to do all the things under the sun. Pick two things that you're passionate about in terms of neonatology. I think in mine, I, I, I picked out quality improvement and mentorship because I really care about bringing up other people to enjoy neonates and to work in neonates. And I really enjoy mentorship of juniors and trainees. So that's what I emphasise in mine. Um, that's what I would advise really in that last section. And get lots of people to read it. That's the only thing I would say. I had like six consultants read mine and they all gave me different advice, but actually it was quite useful to get lots of opinions.
Brilliant. Thank you, guys. Has anyone got any last minute questions? Because I know it's getting very late. Um, anything, nothing yet in the chat. Give you a few minutes. Anyone want to just, uh, if you want to put your hand up on mute and just talk. <laughs> your voices. Whilst people are thinking of questions, um, a definite top tip is this uh, eligibility form. Do it as soon as possible because sometimes the TPDs aren't very quick at what they need to do. We had a paper form which needed signing. It sounds like it's on Kaizen at the moment. So definitely um, like, you know, contact them and chase them up and do it because you need it. Um... Uh, Jamie, I've seen your question. I think ultimately, are you, I mean, I'd have to ask you your individual circumstance, but if you're in ST5 or ST6, you just got to put to one side <laughs> the panic about not having enough research on your on your um, CV and just write what you do have. I mean, I did have a bit because I basically killed myself in SD3 doing lots of research alongside a full needle <laughs> rotor. <laughs> but not everyone has that and not everyone who gets a grid position has that genuinely. So don't worry too much about it. Just focus on what you do have. If you're in SD3, that's a different story. You probably still have time to get involved in some research that could, you know, end up in a first or second person publication. Oh, is that when we're doing interview prep? Thursday, 24th of November. Yes. So just while everyone's thinking of any final questions, we've got a third session coming up on the 24th of November, um, which is uh, to talk a bit more about the interviews and preparation for interviews. So if you want to click that link or while well, you can use the QR code to sign up now, or we'll send out an email again later as well. Um, there's no more questions so I think we'll we'll end there so thank you so much to our lovely speakers um it's been really really helpful um and uh, uh it's been great it's really useful for everyone I think um we've got lots of thank yous coming through in the chat um there's a link there for feedback form for please 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 can you put some feedback for us and uh, we can also send out some attendance certificates uh from that as well uh, I'll send out an email later with both the link to the third session and the feedback form. Um, and also we will be sending out a recording of this um, to everyone who signed up as well for anyone who missed any sections or has missed it tonight. Brilliant. Thank you. I'll just I'll end the recording there. Good luck with everyone. Thank you.